So we're looking at number nine on uh, page 219, it's 3.2. And so if I draw that in, look like this. And All right, so we're looking at that. And so what we want to do first is we want to turn it into a lower triangular form, right? Okay. And so when you turn it into the, or upper triangular form, excuse me. Yes. So uh, when you turn it into upper triangular form, what'd you end up with? Yeah. Oh, oh, uh, negative one, zero, one, one. Negative one, zero, one, one. Okay. 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 So that's what you got, yes? Okay, understood. Um, da, da, da. Let's see. All right, so this is this is news answer. All right, let's see. So if we use elementary row operations, okay. Um, I'm going to pull this one up here. I'm going to make this a one, negative one, zero, one. Um, and then just negative one, zero, one, one. Uh, negative one, negative one, negative one, zero. And zero, one, negative one, one, right? Okay. And so what did I do there? I did two row flips, yeah? Okay. So that's the equivalent of just multiplying by one. So it's like negative one. I took the negative and the negative, yeah. So you guys caught that? Every time we row flip, we are gonna multiply by a negative one. The determinant gets ended and ends up multiplying by a negative one. Um now Next thing that I need to do, I need to do some just elementary row operations. But adding and subtracting a row, what does that do to um, the value of the determinant? Well, okay. No, I don't think it actually does anything. What was your question Yeah. No, when I actually do a um, sorry. Okay. Nope. Determinant stays the same. Okay. So here we go. This is then going to be, that's what I thought. I just had to confirm. Yeah. Um, this will be 1, negative 1, 0, 1. This will be 0, negative 1, 1, uh, 2. This one will be 0, negative two, negative one, one. This will be zero, one, negative one, one. Okay. Now, then we're gonna have, all right, so now what I wanna do, I obviously I wanna get this. Da, 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 da. One, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, one, two, this will be then zero, zero, um, 
I should be able to do the rest of these utilizing just just additions, right? So zero zero two times that should be negative uh, negative three. Okay, two times. Okay, all right. Two times four five. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. 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 Negative three. Excuse me. Three, zero, 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 three. There you go. Okay. And so this would give me positive nine. There it is. Yeah. I was just wondering if you have two flips. Yeah. Anytime, anytime you, you end up with two flips, you end up going back. Because a single, um, a single flip of the rows is multiplication by negative one. So two flips of the rows, multiply it by one. Yeah. Okay. Other questions on the homework? Yeah, Cynthia. Oh, of course you want to do forty-nine. Okay, great. Let's do that. So three point two number forty-nine. Okay. And so there are a couple of properties here. They're all in the book, as I said before. 3.2 number 49 states, um, use only the properties P6, P1, and P2 to find the value of alpha, beta, gamma, such that, and then we get this thing. We get A1 plus beta B1, B1 plus gamma C1, C1 plus alpha A1, right? A2 plus beta B2, B2 plus gamma C2, C2 plus alpha A2, uh, A3 plus beta B3, C2 or uh, B2 plus gamma, uh, excuse me, B3 plus gamma C3, and C4, uh, C3 plus alpha A3. All right, there we go. So we want to find the determinant of this. All right, so this it's not okay. So what number six says? The property the property number six says is basically that what we can do is we can break up um, the additions that are going on here, and then we can utilize that property in order to um, well, essentially uh, find this eventually find this determinant. All right. So a one right. Um, well, fir first thing that I want to get is I want to get, um, yeah, okay, A1, um, B1, C1. So this thing here is going to end up equaling A1, B1, C1, A2 plus beta B2, A, uh, B2 plus gamma C2, B3 plus gamma C3, okay. Gamma C3, or gamma C2, no, sorry. C2 plus alpha A2, and then uh, A3 plus beta B3, B3 plus gamma C3, C3 plus alpha A3, okay? And then this will be plus, beta B1, beta B2, beta B3, okay? And then again, same thing, A2 plus beta B2, uh, B2 plus gamma C2, C2 plus alpha A2, A3 plus beta B3, B3 plus gamma C3, and then C3 plus alpha A3, okay? So that's kind of like how, how that breakup works. So the determinant of this one here is equal to the determinant of these two added together, okay? To follow so far? Yes. We can, but we gotta do it kind of one step at a time. Yeah, it's not like, um, it's not like the, the straight addition Right, uh, it doesn't. The straight addition doesn't work that way. We've got to do it basically one row at a time, right? Um, or yeah, one row 
other time. And the reason, well, I won't get into the reason why. Except the moment I can't remember. Uh, so, but uh, basically, like, it, it's, you're going to have to do one set of time. Okay? But what I want to do is I, I basically want A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, right, as one of my matrices, or at least one of my matrices, and then the other pieces of my matrix, right, okay, to be, to have my betas, my, my alpha, and all. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So now this thing here, okay, I'm going to actually scrunch this just a little bit. I guess that wasn't going to work. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to write a little bit smaller so that um, I can fit more of this in. So this is now going to end up being right a1, b1, c1, and then a2, b2, c2, and then a3 plus beta b3, a uh, b3 plus gamma c3 plus and then uh, C3 plus alpha A3, okay? Plus, and now I've got A1, B1, C1, okay? Um, beta B2, gamma C2, alpha A2, okay? And A3 plus B3, or A3 plus beta B3. Um, B3 plus, uh, gamma, thank you. Gamma C3, and then C3 plus alpha A3, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then plus this port right here, I want to get on my, so I've got a bunch of betas. All right, beta B1, beta B2, you know what, let me clean this up for you and make you a video. Sound good? All right, because like otherwise it's going to take us a long, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a huge amount of class time. I just write it all out, kind of like go through it, it'll be very clean. Sound good? All right, cool. Is so I want you to find... Okay. Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for A. I'll give you five minutes for that. Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for A. Okay. So what we want to do in order to do that is we're going to have, first we're taking a minus lambda i. So we'll have 3 minus lambda, 1, 2, and then 4 minus lambda. And then we're going to find the determinant of a minus lambda i. And that is going to end up equaling 0. Okay. So this is going to end up being 3 minus lambda times 4 minus lambda minus 2. That's 12 minus 4 lambda minus 3 lambda plus lambda squared minus 12, or excuse me, minus 2. Okay. And that's then just rewriting that it's lambda squared minus 7 lambda plus 10, right? Equals 0. A couple things to notice or to, to talk about lambda squared minus 7 lambda plus 10 is called the characteristic, equa uh, characteristic polynomial. Right, so the determinant of a minus lambda i 
is called the characteristic polynomial. And lambda squared minus 7 lambda plus 10 is called the characteristic equation. Okay. Now, so, uh, excuse me, equals zero. So in order to find what lambda is, what we're going to do, I'm basically, right, we're going to get lambda minus 5 times lambda minus 2, okay, equals zero. Yeah? So lambda equals 5 and lambda equals 2. For each one of these guys, we are going to go in and we are going to, so for lambda equals 5, I'm going to plug that into determinant of a or into a minus lambda i. So that's going to be Okay. That's going to be 3 minus 5 2 1 and then 4 minus 5. Okay? And I'm going to basically um Take the RREF of this, and that's going to end up equaling right the RREF of, and this will be negative two, one, two, negative one, okay, which is equal to right negative two, one, zero, zero. Yes, and so we essentially are going to have negative two x1 plus x2 equals 0. And so when we're looking for our null space, the null space of a minus 5i is going to equal um, the vector negative 1 half 1. Okay. Ah, sorry. Negative one half one. Okay? When we do it for lambda equals two, then we're going to have three minus two, one, two, four minus two. Okay? So this is going to give me, we're going to take the REF of this guy, REF of, and this would be one, one, two, two. And that would equal one one zero zero, and so for lambda equals two, right? Our associated eigenvector, that null space, okay, would end up being negative one one. Sorry. All right, so given that's the case, so like I, I'm going to write this, I've got lambda equals two and then I got lambda equals five and we had that we had negative one half and one, right? Or was it positive one half? It was positive one half, wasn't it? It's positive one half, yeah. Positive one half, there we go, positive one half. All right, so let's define something. We're going to define an eigenspace for lambda, okay? So an eigenspace for lambda is the set of vectors V such that AV equals lambda V, okay? So we have AV equals lambda V. So basically it's the set of all vectors that are solutions to uh, AV equals lambda V. It's like the, the entire space of um, eigenvectors, okay? So I want to show an eigenspace, and then we'll call this E1. So and then we'll call this lambda 1, so we'll call this E1. An eigenspace for lambda 1 is a subspace of Rn, okay? So we'll start with that. In order to do that one, so what are the two requirements that I have in order to show this that this is a subspace? 
closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication, okay? Um, Mikhail, you know I'm recording this and then I upload it, right? Oh, got it. All right. Saying that's an awful lot of work for something that's going to be done anyways. All right, so, okay, cool. Um, so A, let, uh, we're gonna let X1 and X2, X1 or X and Y belong to the eigenspace E1, okay? A of X plus Y, right, will equal AX plus AY, okay? Which equals lambda X plus lambda Y because they're both eigenvectors, right? Okay, so basically with just utilizing the definition, we end up with the fact that they're both eigenvectors, right? And so we can, you know, basically get the lambda x and lambda y, right? And then this is going to equal lambda times x plus y. And so if we look here, that, that, that tells me that in fact x plus y is also an eigenvector because we have now lambda times x plus y. That's our definition of being an eigenvector, okay? Now, two, the second one is scalar multiplication. So we're going to say let C belong to R and X belong to E1. Okay. So A times CX equals ACX, which equals CAX. Okay. Which equals. C lambda x, which equals lambda Cx. There you go. Check. So um, the eigenspace is closed under multiplication. Now, what we've seen is we've actually seen, in this case, what we've mostly seen is ones where um, the eigenspace for a particular vector, okay, or excuse me, the eigenspace for a particular eigenvalue is only one dimensional, right? There's one eigenvector for every one eigenvalue. But we don't necessarily have, that, have to have that need to be the case, okay? So let's take a look at an example, all right? And we're going to use, okay, I've got an example here. So here's an example. We're going to talk a little bit about this. Okay. Suppose A equals 3, negative 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, and negative 1, 1, 2. Okay. And in order to do this example, we're going to do, um, we're going to utilize uh, symbol lab. Okay. We're going to find our eigenvalues and eigenvectors using symbol lab. All right, so what we end up with here, okay, is we end up, we've got three eigenvectors. Find the eigenvectors, they're right there. If we look at our eigenvalues, though, we only have two eigenvalues, okay? We only have two eigenvalues, and they're two and three. And so let me just kind of show you what this looks like, how they found those eigenvalues. And so we ended up with this. This is our um, characteristic polynomial, okay? So that's negative uh, lambda cubed plus seven lambda squared plus 60, uh, minus 16 lambda plus 12. And so we end up with negative lambda cubed plus, oh, sorry, seven lambda squared minus 16 lambda. All right, so there's our characteristic polynomial.
And then if you take a look here, one of the nice things that Symbol Lab does is that it's going to go through and it, okay, so there's, I'm going to hide those steps. I want to see, here is what happens when I factor it. Can you guys see that at the bottom? It's going to end up being negative, oh, that's way too big. That's way too small. So I'm just going to use a plus button. All right, there it is. Okay, so the factor is negative uh, lambda minus 2 squared times lambda minus 3 equals 0. Okay, so we have negative lambda minus 2 squared times lambda minus 3 equals 0. That's my characteristic equation when it's been factored. Now what I want you to notice here, or what we're going to talk about, is there are some things in here that we want to kind of, kind of note. The first thing here is this thing, the degree of the polynomial, or the degree of the monomial, right, in the factorization, what that's called is that's called the algebraic multiplicity, okay? This thing here is the algebraic multiplicity. So that's the degree of the factor degree of the factor for lambda. Okay? So in this case, lambda equals 2 has a multiplicity of um, so in our example, lambda equals 2 has a multiplicity of 2 or an algebraic multiplicity of two. And we call that algebraic multiplicity, I wanna make sure that I use this right terminology, okay? So it's not confusing, I believe it's M, okay? M equal to two, okay? And then for lambda equals three, M equals one. Okay, you guys see that? That's the idea. So when I go in and I factor, right, and I factor it down to its, uh, it, it, into monomials, what I end up with is I end up with um, the degree of the monomial that corresponds to the factor. It's called our algebraic multiplicity. Okay. Then I also have something though called the geometric multiplicity. So notice this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna group and Symbol Lab does this for us too. I'm gonna group my eigenvectors with their corresponding eigenvalues or the eigenvalues corresponding eigenvectors. So I have lambda equals two. Okay. So I have lambda equals two, right? And that has zero, zero, one and zero, one, one. Is that what it was? One, one, zero, excuse me. One, one, zero. And then lambda equals three has negative one, zero, one. Okay. Now this, the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue, and notice they all go wrong with the, the eigenvalues, the geometric multiplicity, and we're gonna make that n, just because we don't have enough n's all over the place. The geometric multiplicity n is the number of vectors associated with the eigenvalue and it is the dimension of the eigenspace for lambda. So it's the dimension of the eigenspace for lambda, okay? So if you look here, lambda equals two is the, eigen, the eigenvalue. The eigenspace is two-dimensional. Can you guys see that? So it's a plane in R3, yes? Okay. And what we get then is, is that however many vectors that I have, that's the dimension of the eigenspace, right? And so it's very possible for us to have um, dimensions of eigenspaces that are, they could be bigger, smaller, that kind of thing. Um, now, question, okay? 
So let, let's kind of work this out. What's the nu maximum number, the maximum number of eigen vectors that I could possibly have? N. Why do you say that? What do you guys think? Why? Why can't you go past the size of the matrix? We couldn't do so with the other spaces. It would be weird that I the space of also would go beyond n. I, that makes sense, doesn't it, right? Like, how would you have a two-dimensional subspace, a one-dimensional subspace, and another one-dimensional subspace, for example? Right? Okay. That kind of makes some sense. What do you think? Um, what do you think, Jerry? You think we could actually go beyond, right? So we have this theorem. Okay. The maximum number... The maximum number... of eigenvectors that n can have that an n by n matrix can have is n eigenvectors I mean what happens if like a matrix actually leaves more than n vectors invariant. Isn't that weird? It's challenging, right? It's kind of like a hard, hard thing to think about. Yeah. Yep. By the way, I have another reason for this. It's a very proofy based reason. We're gonna talk, we're gonna sketch it. Um hold on. Wanna show. What is that bullet on the screen? Want to show. Huh? What is that bullet on the screen? The border on the screen? Yes. That's the video space. I, I'm videotaping for Jesse. So yeah. That doesn't mean don't show up. It's a bad idea. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. The algebraic multiplicity is the degree of the factor. Not the highest degree of the factor, it's the degree of the factor. Okay. Now let's think about this. Okay. What's the maximum number of eigenvalues I can have? What's the maximum number of eigenvalues, distinct eigenvalues that are going to have for a given matrix? Yeah. Talk amongst your friends for just a minute. Think about how we find them. So we solve that characteristic polynomial to, to get the eigenvalues, excuse me, the eigenvalues, yes? All right. What's the degree of that? No. It's a three degree, three. It's a three by three, right? Okay. Yes, this, this particular one happens to be a three by three, okay? And the lambda here is negative lambda cubed plus seven lambda squared minus 16 lambda plus two, okay? You guys follow that? How many lambdas, how many possible distinct lambdas can I get out of that polynomial? Three, okay? Now imagine you're, you've got an n by n. And now, like Mikhail said, you're subtracting out lambdas every single time, right? What's the degree of that characteristic polynomial? N, right? It's an N, it's, right? The degree of that polynomial is N. So what's the maximum number of distinct eigenvalues you can get? N, thank you. N, good, that's right, N, yeah? So consequently, the maximum number of eigenvalues that we can get is N, right? Because that characteristic polynomial restricts how many we can get. Now the question then is, if the maximum number of eigenvalues that I can have is N, what happens, just, just behave. Jesse's gonna get a good laugh out of me, my technology. 
All right. So how does that correspond to the fact that the maximum number of eigenvectors that I can have is n? Now I want you to think about it from this perspective, OK? All right. Let's take this one. If we're going to, this is a little side theorem. If a has n distinct eigenvalues, then a will have n distinct eigenvectors. All right? So this is kind of like a, just another kind of thought. And so let's just talk about like everyone will have at least one. Okay? So each eigenvalue has at least one eigenvector. And here's my little mini proof. Since a minus lambda i, or since the determinant of a minus lambda i equals zero, this means the null space of a minus lambda i is not trivial. Why? <laughs> Why is that true? New? Come on, guys. If the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to zero, what does that mean? Yeah, a minus lambda i is not invertible, which means for a minus lambda i v equals zero, right? So the null space of a minus lambda i is not just the trivial solution, okay? It's not trivial. So there is at least one vector in null space of a minus lambda i. Is that? There's got to be at least one. Good. There it is. The question is, can there be more than one? Well, not if we have n distinct ones. That's an issue, right? How do we, okay, so we've got n distinct ones, right? So, if we have n distinct eigenvalues, okay, here's, I'm just gonna kinda like draw a little sketch of this. Let's suppose we have n plus one eigenvectors, all right? So we're gonna have n plus one eigenvectors, right? So for at least, so for at least one of the eigenvectors, or for the, at least one of the eigenvalues, the dimension of the eigenspace is two. And the reason why we're going to say that is if it happens to be that it's only one, that two of the eigenvectors for a distinct eigenvalue happen to be linearly dependent, they're the same vector, right? Okay, just think about that for a second. They're linearly dependent, they're the same vector in the same direction, so they're actually the same vector, right? They become redundant, it doesn't matter, right? So what we're going to say is that instead, yes, okay, that instead of Right. Instead of that one, that uh, the two eigenvectors for a particular eigenvalue being linearly dependent, right? Instead, we're going to say that one of the vectors for a different one, like a lambda two, is actually it, a linear combination of the ones for lambda one. And the reason why is because if I've got n of them, right? Okay, and I add another one on, one of them's got to be a linear combination of the other. Uh, of the other set of uh, of the other set of vectors, can you guys catch that? 
right? Like one of the eigenvectors is a linear combination of, uh, of the other eigenvectors in the set. Yes? Okay. So let lambda 2 be in the eigenspace of lambda 1. And so a linear combination of the eigenvectors of um, lambda 1. Okay? This means, though, that the eigenvalue for lambda 1 is, uh, excuse me, for the eigenvalue for the vector, call it v, call it v for v, is lambda 1. Oops, that's a problem. Because we said that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are actually different from each other, they're distinct. Remember that? So if we have like two of them, right, and we say, okay, this one's going to be a linear combination of these two, so it's in this eigenspace, what does that mean? It's got the same eigenvalue. Right? Since it's got the same eigenvalue, it actually has to be the same eigenvalue. Right? And they're no longer distinct. That's a problem. Right? So, lambda 1 equals lambda 2. And that means the eigenvalues are not distinct. That's a contradiction. We can't do that. So, the maximum number. of eigenvalues for a, uh, excuse me, eigenvectors for a distinct eigenvalue is one. What does that mean? If A has N distinct eigenvalues, A has n distinct eigenvectors. All right. That's cool, man. Now, question is, and we just kind of talked about this, are those n distinct vectors linearly independent? Are they? I actually kind of described it. I just described it instead of our last little piece of conversation. Are they linearly independent? Yeah, Catherine, what do you think? Yes, why? N lambda 2 is in the span of the, uh, the eigenspace of lambda 1, right? If it is the case that they are linearly dependent, that means that one of the eigenvalues, okay, so like the idea here is that one of the eigenvalues, if, if we have an eigenvector, right, okay, if we have an eigenvector that is in fact linearly dependent with the other eigenvectors, then it's in the eigenspace of a separate eigenvalue, right? I know there's a lot of eigen stuff, but this is how this works. Right, so it's actually in the eigenspace. And if it's in the eigenspace, right, okay, then it ha it's not a distinct vector, right? We can basically get rid of it, Boop. right? So every set of eigenvectors is linearly independent. That's nice, right? There's a little um, uh, uh, interesting piece. We're gonna do that kind of without proof, but um, so every set of eigenvectors or we should say distinct eigenvectors, so meaning that they're not scalar multiples of each other. Distinct eigenvectors is linearly independent. Well, that's nice. So if I have n of them, and I know that they're all linearly independent, what do they call that? And linearly independent vectors are called a, in Rn, they're called a basis, right? So 
if I have n linearly independent eigenve uh, eigenvectors in Rn, excuse me, eigenvectors for an n by n matrix A, then the set of vectors is called an eigenbasis. Do you have n of them? Right? Then we can generate a basis for Rn. It's an eigenbasis for Rn, I should state. Or for V, aka Rn, right? If I have n of them, we know that they're linearly independent, right? If I have n in Rn, I get a basis for Rn. Good? That's kind of handy. Ooh, and it's a basis. Well, think about like what we can do with bases. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That is absolutely correct. All right? If we have um, n linearly independent eigenvectors for a matrix A, then the matrix is invertible and the transformation is an isomorphism. Right? And in fact, the isomorphism defines basically an invariant. Um, an invariant transformation. So actually I kind of want to show you something, right? That kind of leads us to a kind of like, it's a little aside, but it's kind of cool, okay? Um, suppose, right? So we have, in this case, in the last case that we had, we have this vector, uh, we have lambda equals two is zero, zero, one, and then we have one, one, zero, and then negative one, zero, one. So that constitutes a basis, right? Because we have three vectors in R3, okay? Here's our example. Right for the matrix A equal to, and I wrote it down. I have it written down here. Three negative one zero zero two zero negative one one two. Okay, we have our eigenvectors. We have lambda equals two, and that goes with uh, zero, zero, one, and one, one, zero. And then lambda equals three goes with, uh, let's get lambda three. Lambda equals three goes with uh, negative one, zero, one. Okay? Now, let's take a vector. Pick a vector, any vector. Huh? A oh, one, one, one. Pick a better vector. Two, three, five. Huh? Two, three, five. Two, three, five. Beautiful. Two, three, five. Okay. Let V equal two, three, five. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to get out of Symbol Lab because I want to show you something. Let me show you something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to transform V. I'm going to find. So first I'm going to find V in my eigenbasis. We'll call it V of E, okay? What V is in my eigenbasis? All right, and so I need, you remember, right, we got, da, 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 da. Zero, one, negative one, uh, zero, what is going to be zero? Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And we'll take that inverse. And then we're going to, was it two, three, five? Yeah. All right, two, three, five. Two, three, five. Okay. So our VE 
is now going to be this value right here. So we're going to put it into the new basis. All right, solution. It's 431. Awesome. Good. Makes life easier. So VE is going to be 431. Remember how we did this in the linear transformation? Right? Okay. Now watch this. So 431, okay, and that's the scalars that are correspond. So 431, right, equals, um, no, excuse me, 235, sorry, 235 equals 4 times 001 plus 3 times 110 plus 1 times um, negative 101, right? Now all A is is a linear transformation, okay? So I'm going to take T, right? I'm going to take T of this one and then T of this whole thing, right? We did some homework like this. You guys remember the homework? All right? Now, so that means that the transformation, if I want to transform... 2, 3, 5, well, what's the transformation? It's going to be 4 times t of 0, 0, 1 plus 3 times t of 1, 1, 0 plus 1 of t times negative 1, 0, 1. What is um, t of 0, 0, 1? It's an eigenvalue. It's an eigenvector that corresponds corresponds to. It's an eigenvector that corresponds to lambda equals two. What happens to zero zero one? What hunter? What happens to zero zero one? Turns into no. It stays a vector. Thank you very much. It turns into two times zero zero one. That's what it means to be an eigenvector, right? We stretch it by its eigenvalue. Okay, so we take our transformation two times two, three, five, and that ends up equaling four times two times zero, zero, one. What happens to one, one, zero? It stretches by two, right? It stays in the same exact direction. It just multiplies by two. That's what it means to be an eigenvector. And then plus one times, what happens to negative one, zero, one? Stretches by three. So we know exactly what happens to each one of these elements, right? So we end up with, right, zero, zero, six, excuse me, zero, zero, six, plus six, six, zero. Oh, eight, excuse me, zero, zero, eight. That's right. I'm so correct. Eight plus six, six, zero, plus negative three zero one uh negative three zero three okay which ends up equaling three six eleven all right three six eleven you guys see that now what do you want to bet that a times two three five is three six eleven Yeah, here's my old one, right? There's my matrix. There it is. Now, you might ask yourself, like, wasn't that like a long way of, of, of thinking about this? Yeah, it's a little harder to conceptualize, but actually the number of computations that we ended up doing was cut about in half. 
we had the, the actual number that we did, we multiplied two scalars together and we multiplied it by a vector and then we added vectors together. We found a linear combination. It was really quick. Okay. And so that's one of the reasons why we use things like eigenbasis because eigenbasis allows us to do things at a, like much faster, right? And faster matters, right, New? Faster matters. Yes? Okay. Cool. So I kind of wanted to show you that because that's kind of cool. All right. Now, we got a couple more definitions and then I'll, I'll let you guys go on a break. Okay. And we'll just kind of work through it a little bit. And then we're going to diagonalize, which you guys are going to th I think is very neat, personally. All right. So here's a definition. If A has n eigenvectors, if A, an n by n matrix, I should state first, an n by n matrix has n eigenvectors, then A is non-defective. What this is saying is, for A to be non-defective, the algebraic multiplicity of the algebraic multiplicity of lambda must equal the geometric multiplicity. for all lambda. For all lambda, okay? So basically, what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to create an eigenbasis for our codomain. We must be able to create an eigenbasis for the codomain in order to have a non-defective matrix, right? A matrix, so here's another defi de definition, okay? Bet you guys can guess how you define it. A matrix is defective, a matrix A is defective if a matrix A is defective if A has fewer than n eigenvectors. Some little corollaries. Simple ones if you think about it. If A has n distinct eigenvectors, A is non-defective. And that's because you have at least one. Well, in the case of having n distinct ones, you have one for every eigenvalue. So if you have n distinct eigenvalues, you must have n distinct eigenvectors, which means that you can construct an eigenbasis, right? Utilizing your eigenvectors. There we are. Okay. Let's take 10 minutes. All right.